In this episode, we talk to our good friend Drew Hinton from Aero Safety. We get into some pretty good stuff here when it comes to safety training. Drew has a pretty unique perspective on defining what training is in the context of OSHA and workplace safety, that is. It was a great conversation. You can see the entire video over at the Safety Pro Podcast community site. It's free to join, so you can watch all these videos. Otherwise, I hope you enjoy this audio out there in podcast land. Now let's get into it. Before we get into today's topic, I have one question for you. Are you still painting your floors for 5S markings, things like that? Don't do that. Head over to MightyLineTape.com forward slash podcast, a great partner in safety. They've been with us from the beginning. They have some really good products that are going to get you out of a whole lot of time, material, and maintenance and upkeep. Their floor marking tape is second to none. It takes up easily, doesn't leave a sticky residue. They've got floor tape with beveled edges for forklift traffic, carts, things like that. So it really holds up well to that kind of traffic in your facility. They also can do custom floor signs. If you have a particular logo or a message, they can make that happen. Get a free sample and try it for yourself. Again, head over to MightyLineTape.com forward slash podcast. Tell them that we sent you. You will get a free sample to try out in your facility today. Again, MightyLineTape.com forward slash podcast. All right, Drew Hinton, hanging out with Drew. All right. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. How are you, Blaine? Doing all right. You've been uh, you've been on the go. You're training this week, right? Doing an OSHA 30 hour. Yeah, never never ending. But I was home for a few weeks, so I'm back on the road now. But yeah, I'm doing an OSHA 30 general industry course for uh, today through Friday. Nice, man. It's been a while for me on the outreach training, but um, you know, we were texting earlier, and I love how I love how we do this. We're like, hey, let's get on a call. <laughs> Let's record. Right. So like it, it's in the evening and I know you're on central standard time and I, well, I can't believe you bothered me with that, slow time with that central <laughs> <laughs> me being on Eastern standard time. But, um, have you had dinner at least? I have. <laughs> oh, there you go. I haven't, I, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait, have dinner after. Oh man, I'm making um, you wait. Nah, it's all good. It's all, it's anything for you, my friend. <laughs> um, so so we were talking earlier and we were talking about training in general, like you just sort of all things training, but you have an, I would, I want to say it's an inter interesting take right on training. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't even hear other safety professionals talk about training in this context. So we're, we're going to talk about a couple of things. So first, what is training? <clears throat> So is, <laughs> he clears his throat. <laughs> here we go. Give him my soapbox here. <laughs> training is, you know, I'm using air quotes here. Training is not toolbox talks or tailgate meetings, all that stuff. Um, like you and I were talking about, there is actually two um, standard interpretations, a lot of interpretations out there that tells you that training has to result in mastery of that skill. Right. Yep. So, I'm just doing a five minute toolbox talk. I'm not, I'm not mastering anything. I might get a quick, you know, some, some knowledge. Maybe I have, have, or have not heard before, but I'm not evaluating anything. I'm not demonstrating anything. So that's going to help based off of that. That's going to help you dictate how long that training needs to be and how in depth it is so that you can make sure that you're evaluating them. You know, as you're aware, just like the NFPA, we got all those JPRs. That's what we're looking for. Those job performance requirements to make sure that we're evaluating them and they are, in fact, mastering that particular skill. So what would you classify, what I was going to ask you, <clears throat> you're talking about like toolbox talks or, or stand-up, you know, topics. What would you classify those as? Because we have different levels, right? We have training in the strictest sense of the term that you're speaking about. But then we also have some other requirements. There's refresher, right? Right. Training. There's awareness level training. So are, are, are you saying there are categories of training and we shouldn't talk about all of them the same way? Yeah, essentially. I mean, every, everything is combined into your training program. 
And so, you know, no matter what it is, let's say it's confined space. On my confined space training program, my formal training is going to be classroom, demonstration, running scenarios, all that stuff. But then the toolbox talk is just to supplement that. You know, it could be just a, whether you want to do a weekly or monthly or daily, whatever it is, everybody's a little bit different on the frequency of those things. But it's just to supplement those things. You know, I mean, OSHA's come out with a few stances on, you know, some different topics related to your entire training program, uh, you know, especially around computer-based training. They tell you that it, mm-hmm. that cannot just be your training program alone, but it can supplement your training. So it can sound like kind of the same concept with the toolbox talk or tailgate meetings. It can supplement those as a, just a quick refresher, yep. just kind of keep things going for you. Now, the other thing we should talk about, and I, and I experienced this firsthand, unfortunately, in my past, OSHA, OSHA will accept toolbox talks at for what they are, so long as, and this is how I hear other safety professionals talk about training, so long as it's documented property, properly. It is uh, a list of a description of what is discussed, a list of attendees, the date, time, you know, the standard stuff, and the signature of the person presenting the material. But that doesn't nec- that doesn't mean OSHA would consider that the training as defined by your opening statement as right. mastery of a skill, right? Right. Um, it can it can support or help bolster your ongoing overall efforts around you know awareness and keeping safety uh, about a particular topic front of mind. Um, but uh, you don't use toolbox talks to say, oh no, this person is highly qualified. <laughs> <laughs> to get into that confined space and weld, we had a toolbox talk last week. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, so, and I've, you know, for you just as well, I've seen plenty of companies try to submit that to OSHA as documentation for training. You know, sometimes they'll accept it, but I, the situation I've seen that they accepted that is they don't have the title at the top of the page as toolbox talks, they have it as safety training. And, you know, yes. myself and the customer, whoever it is, know dang well that that was a toolbox talk, but because OSHA sees it as safety and training, they take it for their word. Go. And what's the risk, right? That I think you just touched on it. The risk is that OSHA could, could find that your safety training program is inadequate because that's what you're basing your safety training program on are these awareness level supplementals that that don't rise to the level of expectation that OSHA has. Um, and, and you say we have various interpretations of this. So, so let's get into that next topic. I, I've seen this a lot in my past. <laughs> so one of my favorite parts about outreach training was the introductions, the opening day, the opening you know hour or so where I, uh, I got some Uh, introductions out of the way, but I also asked everybody, like, what are your expectations? Why are you here? Some variation of that. And it was always fun to listen to some of the folks in the room say, oh, well, we got to have a 30 hour to get this job, to get this bid, right? Or um, I need, we're we're required, we are required to have fall protection training. So we're good. And I'm like, oh, so that, that helps me, right? Right. What does OSHA say about outreach training itself? What is it and what is it not? It is 100% voluntary and it does not meet any requirements of any kind of regulatory training. So they come out flat out and say that in the in the outreach training materials or procedures that, that specifically is strictly voluntary. It even says it on the back of your, your outreach completion card. It'll say on the very back that it's, that it's strictly voluntary. So... Just like you mentioned, some people are under the impression that it meets, you know, if I have to have rest pro protection training or fall protection training, that that's going to check all those boxes. And it's not. It is It is more of a hazard identification and awareness and figuring out how to mitigate risk. Now, for me, I'll, I'll touch on OSHA regulations. But that's not the intent. It's not to sit there and go through all the standards and tell them here's what OSHA says about, you know, 1926-502 says X, Y, and Z about fall protection. 
That's not the intent of it. It's just to help them identify hazards, help them figure out, uh, do an assessment with those hazards, and then come up with some kind of mitigation plan based on the hierarchy of controls. So you have to, you can do the 30, it's voluntary. You can do the 30 hour yep. and it's perfectly good and well, um, but you still have to meet all other required trainings. You cannot use the fact that you had a 30 hour as OSHA required training. So that's, I have seen, like you, uh, like you said, I've seen in the past companies get into some trouble with that. And as an instructor, you point that out and they're like, you know, they don't want to take it. They don't want to accept it, but right. it is what it is. You know, uh, that card does not, you show that card to OSHA, that's not going to satisfy the mandatory training that you will find under certain standards, uh, certain specific standards, confined space entry, rescue, ha uh, has whopper is a good, has calm, right. uh, fall protection. I mean, you just go down the list. So how do you address that or how have you addressed that with your clients? I know, you know, you're the president of Aero Safety. I think we probably should have led with that, but I, I take for granted everyone already knows you. <laughs> Hopefully so. Um, yeah. I mean, every, but how do you address that with your, uh, with your clients? Yeah. Every class that we send, we, we do, and we send out an estimate, we'll send out a course outline to show them exactly what it's covered. If there, if there is any certifications, which this one's going to tell you on the course outline, there is no certification because it doesn't, it just provides you a, a completion card. Um, yeah. but, it, but on that specific outline, I will say the statement straight from the OSHA outreach training procedure that it is strictly voluntary, does not meet any regulatory requirements. And then I will also put that in an email to make sure they are aware of that. Um, so there are, you know, they'll always try to come back. Like you've mentioned, they'll kind of come back and they'll, I'll let them say, here's your choice of electives. And then we can pick one of op optional topics and they'll try to come back and, and base, base that off of what trainings they think they need. Like you said, Oh, we need a fall protection. So let's go ahead and do fall protection. I'm like, Okay, this is not going to provide any. You're still going to have to do fall protection or whatever it is outside of this. Yeah. So, like I said, I've every course outline we send with every estimate has that it's the, the wording straight from the OSHA outreach procedures on there, and then I'll follow that up with an email whenever we're going back and forth about that, just to make just to make sure that there's no misinterpretation. So you do a lot of you know rope rescue, fall protection. I mean, very specific technical training. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you get like really deep into it. Going back to what you said at the beginning, if the expectation is, even if it's loosely defined in an interpretation that OSHA has published, um, if the expectation is a mastery of a skill, how do you approach that technical training? And how do you ensure that there's some level of mastery of that skill? And then how do you how do you then transfer that to the employer? Because, you know, you're doing it for hire. And so how do you handle that? And what would you recommend others do that are looking to do this type of training as well? Sure. So, you know, one thing I'd recommend right off the bat is, you know, you have to develop your your learning objectives for the class. What do what do you want them to master at the end of that course? And so <clears throat> once we take that, we'll we'll develop those essentially the JPRs. We'll have a skill evaluation sheet. So if taking the high angle rescue, the, the rope rescue class, for example, we will have a skills evaluation sheet that documents, okay, this person, you know, demonstrated how to properly, you know, utilize knots. And then it gives examples, you know, the bowling, figure eight, figure out how to bite, all that stuff. And then it'll reference whatever standard it is. So it may be an FPA, you know, 1006, OSHA, whatever it may be, we'll reference that standard and every single individual person on there will be evaluated individually. We have to run multiple evolutions. We, we typically do anyways, but we're going to run multiple evolutions. And that's why we dictate the class, you know, at the length that we do, you know, I'm not going to teach a, a rope rescue, high angle rescue class in an eight hour time period. There's no way that I can cover all the materials from a knowledge standpoint, as well as all the materials from a demonstration and practical evaluation, all that stuff. So, Oh, and can you put 25 people in there too? That's that's the, another good request. I got 30 guys. Can you do this in half a day right. if we provide pizza? We need it tomorrow too. Yeah. <laughs> but then we'll we'll take those skills evaluations and obviously we'll give those to the customers. That way they have documented proof that from my, my signature on the bottom of that evaluation form saying that they I verified that they have 
demonstrated this skill. Um, now there are some things that you know will you know document as critical items. So for example, if a you know if I'm hiring a rescue rope rescue class, any kind of unsatisfactory, we'll either say it's satisfactory or unsatisfactory. Anything that's unsatisfactory, they've got to do it again. Um, but like some things that are you know for example on like forklift operator training, some of those are are you know kind of non non critical, kind of nice to know you know items. You know, we'll say that they can miss up to a certain amount on those and still pass that. But we will also put that they, if we have uh, corrected them verbally, if depending on what the skill is, corrected them after the fact and that they have acknowledged that they are, you know, yeah. OK with whatever that deficiency was. It's good stuff. So. One other aspect of training and you brought up forklift training and I know. <clears throat> There are several letters of interpretation out on this. Who is qualified to train? So what 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 is OSHA's? We'll start with OSHA because you know sort of, that's the regulating body for the most part, and then we can expand from there. I know you've got uh, NFPA and there's ANSI, but let's start with OSHA. What does OSHA say, for example, with forklifts? Who who's qualified <clears throat> to train? So more or less, they do have an interpretation that says you've had to have operated a forklift similar to the model. And if there's any attachments that they're operating, you have to be able to, that you have had to have done that yourself. Uh, that's outlined in the standard interpretation that says, if you haven't operated yourself, how are you qualified to make that evaluation? Now you can do the classroom yeah. portion. If you have the knowledge and ability to do the classroom portion and you're qualified to teach those topics, you can certainly do that. And then maybe have somebody, you know, I've worked at companies to where the foreman would do the evaluation. I would do the classroom portion. I would go out there with them and let the foreman do the evaluation because the foreman's the one that's been operating the forklift on that particular attachment. So yep. you've got to have in that environment, right? Exactly. So you've got to have, you know, I, I can maybe do the book smarts thing and then let somebody else do, you know, a way I understand that the street smarts, but if you have yep. to be able to, if you're doing the practical evaluations of them actually demonstrating it for you, You've got to be able to. You've got to be able to have that history yourself. If you don't, then you're you're not qualified to do that performance evaluation. Like I said, you can do the classroom, you know, as long as you're qualified to do that. But if you haven't operated the forklift and that particular in that particular attachment, like you said, in that environment, then you would not be qualified to do so. Yeah, and I think where I've seen folks get in trouble in the past is the the whole the vague definition of uh, qualified meaning. Uh, through education or experience, mm -hmm. you have uh, working knowledge of this particular topic, and you know they kind of leave it open ended. Yep. So, um, rope rescue, high angle rope rescue, um, or a rope rescue, high angle rescue, things like that. Your background in the fire service, for example, in performing rescues, confined space entry, uh, that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, you know, and I, I share that fire background with you as well. And, and so that helps, but have you seen like, or come across other folks that are doing this technical training that, you know, God bless them, but you kind of scratch your head and go, I, I don't, I don't know that, you know, you guys are actually meeting the, the requirement that is set forth in this particular topic. Yeah. You know, one of the, you know, one of the most common things I see is people take those can train the trainer courses online, you know, not even yep. in person. There's no person evaluating you, you know, by what's one thing to have a zoom meeting, but still I can't, I can only do so much, but they'll take these yeah. train the trainer courses and that they're, you know, they're just going, they're basically, you know, for a forklift trainer trainer half the time, they're just running them through an operator course, not teaching them how to teach a class. You know, if I'm right, I, you know, we will do some train the trainer courses and then we'll tell them for whatever it is, you know, if you're doing a train trainer for forklift, you have to be a forklift operator. I'm not going to train because I'm going to teach you how to teach the class, how to evaluate the person, all that stuff. Um, you know, it's people kind of get in trouble with those. Like I said, that's probably the most common thing I see is they'll take those kind of can train the trainer yeah. um, you know, qualifications. Like you said, you know, we've you know, I've got the background, but then even but even OSHA versus ANSI is going to have a little bit different definition of what that qualified person is. Because qualified is very task or project or equipment specific. You know, I can be qualified yeah. for one thing and not for the next. But the right. difference between OSHA and ANSI is OSHA is going to tell you, you can either have street smarts or book smarts. So you got a qualification by, you know, certification, training, education, or 
experience, and then Auntie will tell you they want both. They want you to have some kind of knowledge, education, as well as demonstration of that particular topic. So your practical skills as well. And that's what we typically try to try to enforce on any. We always follow pretty much everything's national consensus standards. So we're going above and beyond those OSHA things. Uh, but that's what we kind of really want to enforce when we're doing those train the trainers is I need you to have the knowledge and I need you to have the skills. And that's where, you know, those, like I said, those JPRs come into play because it says, here's what knowledge they have to have. Here's the skills they have to be able to demonstrate. Man, that's good. I, you're bringing me back to my construction days. Um, the standard was always like for, a, you know, a dozer operator or a track hoe operator. The employer must ensure that that operator is qualified. Yep. That was it. That was it. And it's like, well, it says on his resume, he's been operating a dozer for 15 years. Right. He's, you know, to me, uh, i have that's good for me. That's good enough. I watched him. It goes forward and backward and the blade goes up and down. Right. You know? Um, and now so they're doing we, that on the cranes yeah, though. Too. a lot of open. Yeah. What's that? I said, now they're doing that on the mobile cranes too. So you, you know, you can go out there and get a certification for telescoping boom crane up to 21 tons, but it's up to the employer to come back and make sure you're qualified at whatever model, whatever category mobile yeah. crane you want to do in that work environment. You know, what's interesting is um, the forklift training, we, we, going back to that as an example, the, the same standard for forklift training requirements also applies to rough terrain forklifts. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> totally different environment, totally different model. Yep. To, and, and yet you could have, you know, somebody come out uh, from some company that supplies your PPE They'll send somebody out and do forklift training. And it's like, wait, but how, how do you know that individual is competent as an operator on a rough terrain forklift right. with a boom arm, right? right. Or uh, an indoor rated uh, forklift only, right? right. Um, in a warehouse setting or something <clears throat> like that. So that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so being qualified. So this brings up a, a good point. You talked about uh, performance requirements, job performance requirements. and I think uh, we we need as an industry we need to start pushing for job performance requirements for trainers. Like, I think a, a good approach for a company, small or large, is to identify those who can train based on the experience that they have, and then you can actually put them through a train to trainer. That is how to teach, how to train. Which I I think that part's missing right a lot. How to how to increase engagement. <clears throat> how to read the room, how to do an evaluation, how to present material so that people don't fall asleep. How often do you have breaks? How do most adult learners learn? That kind of stuff is, is more, I mean, if they can operate a forklift, don't, don't sweat that. You know that like, right. this is other stuff that we need to, to do better on. Do you, do you see a lot of companies that have this part down that they've got a pretty good roster of like, this is Blaine and these are the topics he can train and here's how we know. And this is Drew and these are the topics he can train. And, and this is Jane. She can train these based on what we know, what she knows and has done. Is there a good approach out there or something that you would recommend like that? Yeah. <clears throat> Overall, I don't, I don't see it as often as I'd like to see it done, but we, yeah. we always follow as far as our teaching methodology and then, and then how we conduct our, train the trainer courses, we follow the ANSI Z490.1 standard that goes into training, you know, like you mentioned, how to conduct a class methodology, but also it has trainer qualifications. And one thing that's, you know, I emphasize is continuous evaluation. So just because I get, you know, my, you know, train the trainer certification today, you know, 30 years from now, I never go back and do refresher training myself, then am I still qualified? Yeah. And I actually had that conversation with, um, uh, an older gentleman back at, it's probably early, earlier in the year, probably in the spring was attending a, a regional ASSP, uh, PDC conference. And there was this guy probably in his sixties or seventies. And we were sitting there talking. We, we ended up having a, a mutual connection and he was asking me, he said, you know, do you think I need to come to these classes? Why, why am I even here? These professional development seminars? I was like, yeah, you do. He's like, well, I've been doing this for 30 something years, you know, I don't really need to go back and do this stuff. I'm like, yeah, you still need to make sure you're qualified. So I don't, I don't, yeah. you know, I don't see as as much. I'd like to, to your point, 
about people listing what they're evaluating. A lot of places just say, oh, you're the safety guy or safety girl. So you can teach whatever safety related it is, which puts right. puts you in a bind because they're assuming you can. And maybe you stand up to them and say, look, I'm not qualified to do this, which takes, you know, maybe it hurts your pride. Maybe it doesn't, but that's, that's your responsibility to say, look, I'm not qualified to teach this stuff. We've got to hire a third party, you know, third party consultant training firm, whatever it is to do this, you know, companies may, you know, kind of get upset with that because they, like I said, they're just assuming that any safety professional can teach any topic that's falling under OSHA's jurisdiction and, uh, and be okay with that. So kind of puts the safety professionals in mind, but you know, it, it is a great, it is a great option to at least, especially if you have multiple trainers to list out, like you said, what each person is qualified in. So, I mean, that's what we'll do. But what the safety, what the safety professional can do is what you just said, identify those resources that do meet that standard. So that's what you do for the employer. Yep. You ensure that we are in compliance and that we are getting the resources that we need for these technical training uh, topics. Um, and, and that, and so that's a good way to turn it around on an employer that kind of scratches their head and go, what do I pay you for then? And it's like, well, <laughs> I mean, good question. <laughs> you've seen a Swiss army knife. I mean, it'll, it'll do a lot of things, but it won't do them well, you know? Right. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's a, a good approach uh, to take. I've also seen it on the flip side. I've also, I've also seen like safety professionals get, get into trouble, uh, get a little in over their head, I should say, by getting into training topics that not just technical topics, but let's say, you know, you're coaching others and, you know, managers, uh, supervisors, and about how to have conversations, difficult conversations with somebody. And because the context is, you know, about safety, now all of a sudden we're getting into, I'm going to say, I'm going to use air quotes here, HR or people development. Right. And we're like, going to we're going to do a session on how to coach somebody. And it's, it's like, unless, you know, what makes you uniquely qualified? You know, myself included, I ask myself all the time, am I uniquely qualified through education or experience to, to teach coaching habits, you right. know, for, which is a very broad, it's not even safety related. Now we're getting into like just professional development. I've seen safety professionals like, well, we're going to have a, how, how to have critical conversations session with managers. I'm like, Time out. I've talked to you, I don't know how many times, and I don't think you you should be teaching. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, being able to know when to where your limitations are in, in the organization and what assets you have and and what assets you need to acquire uh, external, I think is really is really key. Right. Um what are you, what are your thoughts on that one too? Cause I know we, we talk about that sometimes about right. professional development stuff. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely opens up people that just want to get it. They knowingly or unknowingly get outside of their realm, right. It opens up liability for the yeah. company. So for example, like what we do or what I do with my employees is when they first get hired, I have them do a self evaluation. So I'll list out all these topics on a form. Okay. I want you to go through and evaluate yourself. What do you think that you're, you know, this topic here rigging, do you think you're, poor knowledge, you're, you know, average, or you think you're, you know, excelling at this particular topic. And so I'll take that. And then before I let anybody teach something, I will, I will watch them teach that. Um, or they will sit in with me. And so I'll, if they, if they, if I let them, I think they say they're excellent on something, I may let them teach it and I'll sit there and watch them. That way, if something happens, you know, I can, I can interject and, and square things away. But just like you said, you know, sometimes people get thrown into other situations, HR, operation, whatever it is. And, you know, that opens up a big liability from you as a company. If something does go wrong or there's something that you're not familiar with that you just violated, you know, if you're not familiar with all these HR laws, I mean, there's HR people in, in, you know, as a whole or operations, whoever it is, they're not safety professionals in most cases. Just like safety professionals, they're typically not HR and operations professionals. So we kind of, right. you kind of, kind of like the whole Kevin Hart phrase, you know, just stay in your lane, right? <laughs> That's what we got to make sure we're doing. Yeah, I mean, and I think it's, and it, and it goes back to what you said about the individual at the ASP, ASSP uh, meeting. Like, you know, the minute, the minute you, I'm not saying that individual thought they knew everything, right. but they certainly sent a signal that they didn't think they needed to learn anything else. Right. Which might be the same thing. 
once yeah. you once you get into that mindset, you you stop learning. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I had my teaching certificate in the state of Ohio. I taught college. I I been feels like I've been training and educating my whole career, um, and I love it. I'm st I still learn. I, I'm still learning. I talk to people like you and pick your brain. Look, I'm ripping you off, man. I'm taking notes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's how I get by. So <laughs> I just can't imagine being in that in that situation where you're like, nah, I got this. The way I do it is the way it's the way it needs to be done. And there is the best way to do it. And that's it. On the other and on what that also leads to, and you posted about this um just oh, what day is today? Was it this week or last week? About the Dunning Kruger effect. Mm -hmm. Um so one is you can get a little bit of knowledge about something and your confidence goes through the roof. Mm -hmm. What that can lead to is this, some people call it overconfidence, but what it is, is it leads to you thinking you know more about something than you actually do. Or I know about this, I'm pretty smart. So that means I must know about these other things right. and you don't take the time to learn them. Do, do you see folks getting into trouble with that? Because I know you posted that and there's yeah. a reason why. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it's the whole concept of that effect is just that you don't know what you don't know until you find yeah. out. I mean, sometimes that, that effect will kind of put you in your place. You, you start, like you say, you start kind of getting overconfident in yourself and then something happens, whether, you know, sometimes it's even one of your students calling you out on something, right? Um, or it's, you know, OSHA shows up or some kind of lawsuit, whatever, heaven forbid, something like that happens, but something puts you in your place to make you realize, oh, I don't, I don't know as much as I thought. And then kind of the cycle yeah. starts over, but that's where we want to get to is ultimately we want to get to the point of saying, look, us being honest for ourselves, like, I don't know what I don't know. And then you start that continuous improvement process for ourselves of trying to continuously educate. Right. So that's the, you know, that's like, like the gentleman, right? You know, he's, he's teaching these things that maybe he learned 20 years ago. It's kind of like, you know, the whole concept of the way he learned it 20 years ago too. Right. Right. I mean, it's kind the of, approach. it's yeah. kind of the concept of, you know, OSHA versus all these consensus standards. OSHA stuff is a lot of those things haven't been touched since they came out in 1971. Whereas <laughs> all these NIOSH information, NFPA, all that stuff's is updated every three, five years, whatever it may be. So it's a lot more relevant. But if, yeah. you know, if you're not going back and improving yourself and finding out what's happening today versus what's happening 20 years ago, you know, that's like I said, that's just opening door liability. You're doing yourself a discredit. You're doing your students a discredit because they think they're getting, you know, good information and they're getting information that hasn't been updated and they could probably tell you more about what's going on now than you can. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just covering a topic. It isn't training or education. Right. And you, you find that a lot where somebody just covers something and it's like, well, I could have handed that to them and they could have yep. read it. You know what I mean? There was no value of me covering this information for right. them because I was the one talking. Right. There's, there's a lot of other things missing there. Yep. So, um, Man, just so you can now you got me thinking about Dunning Kruger effect. I'm thinking of examples. <laughs> we, we are, oh, you know what is very, um, we do this. I'll use an example that I think everybody can relate to. And it's pretty much right down the middle of the road. So we should be okay. And that is celebrities, right? Right. Celebrities. They're really good at celebritying, whatever that is. Uh, they're singing, they're, uh, they're acting, uh, whatever, right? They tell jokes, right? So they're really good at that or they get popular, make a lot of money. And then they start commenting or opining, or we start asking them. That's usually what happens. What is your position on this? Or what do you think about this topic? Or what? And it's like, what? Well, I don't know. I'm a, <laughs> yeah, I'm a singer. What do you think about it? You right. know, um, we, and then they start doing ads and they start pitching products and, and they, that's a great example of the dunny. We attribute like, oh, they use that supplement. So, and they're really successful. So they must be smart. <laughs> it's like <laughs> they're an actor. What are, what are you, are you going to get supplements based on what, you know, this person says because they act. Yeah. Um, it's that sort of getting out of their space. Right. Yep. Absolutely. That's funny. 
<laughs> we should do a whole episode on that. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, trust me, I'm a safety professional. That's gonna be I'm gonna get a uh, bumper sticker this <laughs> <laughs> I'll just, I'll get the whole shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. I'm a safety professional. That's, that is funny. Well, oh man. What else, what else you want to cover for training? What's uh, what bugs you about training or what do you see that uh, people get wrong that we haven't covered? Yeah. One thing that I probably see a lot is people not ho- knowing how to manage their students. Um, Oh, because the attendees. Yeah. And so you, you can get these courses that kind of run off and, you know, it, it's, you know, it's wasting your time. So when I mean, you've got all these things that you should be learning about when you become a trainer, but you've got different types of, you know, I guess call it personalities of students, right? So you've got kind of the storytellers that everything you say, they're going to have a story to top it. And that's going to sit there and, you know, if you let that person continue without putting a stop to that, that's going to take half your class time and you're not actually for using as a trainer as an instructor, not be out of time in order to cover what you need to cover. You know, you get somebody that asks stupid questions more or less that's sitting there just asking questions, just to ask questions, just to, you know, cause a scene. And then you get, you well, know, we used to, they want to monopolize the clock. They want right. to burn. They were like, I know a way to get to the end faster. Right. And that's their, that's their game sometimes. Not always. Yeah. Some of them are genuinely curious. So what are some tips for people that are like, okay, I do want to up my training game as a trainer. What are some quick tips? We're not going to solve all the problems on this episode, but what's, what's a quick tip for that? I mean, just continuously improve yourself. I mean, like with our employees, we require all of our employees to have so many X amount of hours of professional development every year just to make sure they are up to date on their things. Um, you know, once they are, once they're with us, we'll, we'll pay for that stuff, but never, like you said, never stop learning is the big concept. Um, things change, whether we're aware of it or not, so things, regulatory changes, equipment changes, technology changes. So continuously be evaluating yourself. And that's something that, you know, even in like during incident investigations that people just skip right over, it was, okay, we were, we were trained or that person was trained on X, Y, and Z, but did the trainer even know what they were doing and left out all this key information, right? So the people tend to skip over that. So just making sure, like you said, to um, just continuously, continuously invest in yourself, you know, even if the employer doesn't want to, you know, send you out to this thousand dollar course, if you can just, uh, you know, even attend a webinar, you know, once a month, just something to keep you continuously improving yourself is going to be crucial. I used to, um, I use this and I, I teach folks this too, when we, we just did a train the trainer recently. So it's top of mind for me, um, is, you know, folks will come in and they'll have their laptop open. They'll sit down and they'll like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to come to training and, and, uh, they'll, they'll sit there and work. And I'll, first thing I'll tell them, laptops closed and they look at you like they're, they're freaking out because it's like well <laughs> what am I supposed to do? who's gonna run the business and i'm like that's a you problem you should right. co- if you don't have coverage you need to go and right. we'll do this another time but yep. but that's the first thing the other one is um is folks that like you said they're they're distracting but they don't do it on purpose but they'll, they'll talk to each other. They'll be, they'll, they'll like chuckle and like, you know, point, they're not really engaged or paying attention is as an instructor, go just wander over their direction and stand near them while you're talking or presenting. Like they'll, they'll shut up because you're right there. Right. I mean, there's like little tips of like working the room that, you know, you could be a safety professional and you know, this technical topic, but do you know how to teach it? Do you know how to educate? Uh, do you know how to train? Do you like that's the stuff that's missing that I think we could do a lot better with as a profession uh, because this stuff is is somewhat dry, but making it relatable, showing you know them what's in it for them, showing them the risk of not understanding this topic uh, to their to themselves to the business. If you're talking to supervisors, I mean, there's different ways to sell this stuff to get it, to make it stick. Right. And um, and there's not one best way. That's the whole thing is you've got to know all these different techniques and approaches. Um, How do you do you. So when I sat in on it at the National Safety Council, I heckled you not too much. (laughs) I don't think I heckled you at all. Actually, I did take some photos Um, for anyone watching. I'll drop uh, Drew's photo of him doing his thing. Like, I don't know. He's got (laughs) it. Yeah. 
Uh, I'll, I'll throw that up here. And, um, but I, I was, I was taking note of like the examples you were giving about how certain gases behave and like, like you didn't, you didn't approach it all sciencey, even though it was sci- a scientific, you know, class. Um, right. If you think about it, but you made it, you, you related it to things that most people understood and, and know about. You asked a lot of questions. You asked them what they thought, like, what do you think about this scenario right here? And then you talked about the scenario instead of just telling them. Sure. Um, do, do you pick up on like other trainers? Do you sit in on other trainers and take notes and you look for those types of tips? So like, oh man, I should do that um, as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've even sat in on, you know, essentially our competitor stuff and not to just kind of steal their ideas, but to learn, to improve. Everybody does it a little bit differently. And so yeah, whether it's somebody you like or not, just, I try to do some, when I take when I personally take a training, I try to do it somebody different every time. Sometimes you'll get really good instructors. Sometimes there'll be terrible instructors, but at least if you get terrible ones, at least you know what not to do. Right. Um, oh yeah. I've been in some brutal <laughs> ones. Oh my right. God. But yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You know, trying to figure out how can you improve it as yourself, and even like I said, there's been competitors. Where I've learned some. Like, huh, I didn't, I didn't think of it that way, or I, I didn't know that. And yeah. you kind of, kind of, like I said, put your pride aside and just, you know, under, understand yourself. And like I said, know, you know, understand what you don't know. Uh, it doesn't matter who's who's teaching it. Now, make sure to, you know if you start getting a little red flags that hey, I don't, I think this person's kind of giving some off the wall answers, you know, maybe verify, yeah. you know, verify later on, but uh, you know, at least try to expand your knowledge based on what other people out there in the industry are doing as well. Yeah. And more, more lately, I've definitely um, been more in tune to, to that for me picking up on the approach and looking for new ideas to, to make training engaging and, and make it stick, right. Make yep. it sticky. And, um, and so that's what I tend to, to listen for or look for when I go to some of these seminars. Um, but hey, good job at the National Safety Council in uh, San Diego. I love sure. that. That was a, you had all kinds of props and and everything. You travel with all that stuff, <laughs> <laughs> all your gas meters and right. hoses and Just keep them up, keep them yeah. in my back pocket, right? You never, that right? you, you never know when you're going to get a guy run across the, the platform at, at, at the safety council meeting and right in front of you when you're trying to do a podcast, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, no, I just, uh, as long as they're not selling gloves. But, uh, <laughs> so many glove uh, selling folks at these conferences that just gloves everywhere. Right. But um all right, man. Hey, great topic. Thanks for uh, hopping on. Um, I'm going to go grab some dinner. I know you already ate, but you've got what? Another couple of days left or is tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, the last day for your 30 or no, you no, got I started today. Days. So we've got three more days. So we'll finish up on Friday oh, afternoon. My goodness. All right. So you just cracked the, uh, you just cracked the egg here. Today. Yeah. That's right. Wow. All right. Well, keep me posted on how it goes okay. and, um, we'll catch up afterwards. And so I appreciate your, uh, your contribution to not just our industry, but, you know, the podcast, you've been a, such a good friend of the podcast, willing to share your expertise. You know, you don't find that too often. So I appreciate it, Drew. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. All right, man. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. All right. Once again, our good friend, Drew Hinton, lots of good stuff discussed in this episode. You can visit Drew's website, aerosafetyus.com. The link is also in the show notes. Again, just a reminder, Head on over to the Safety Pro Podcast community. A lot going on over there. You don't have to be a premium member. It's free to join. We don't spam you. We don't ask for any credit card information or any of that garbage. You could just sign up for free. That link is also in the show notes. Be sure to click on that. You can see full video of all of our episodes that we record, as well as posts from other community members. If you want to create your own post, you want to reply and comment, you do have to be a premium member, but again, joining is free and we have a lot of members over there that are just consuming content and liking content and watching our videos, which is really cool. And it's a great platform for safety pros to collaborate. So again, go ahead and check out the Safety Pro Podcast community site and I will talk to you on the next Safety Pro Podcast. 